this is even more impressive than <laughs> standing there. I never expected that one day I would stand here in the council of a Gothic church talking about the Eurozone of, of all subjects. I see that I'm, in fact, putting my notes on a text of the prophet Isaiah, <laughs> who, as you know, was complaining all the time, his whole life, he was complaining <laughs> about how bad the world is, and uh, in a way, I'd be going, I'm going to do the same thing. So. <laughs> It's nothing is the result of chance, isn't it? Uh, so let me start out about, I'm going to talk about the future of the Eurozone. Um, certainly the Greek crisis has exposed a number of design failures that uh, we have in the Eurozone. And, and some of, the in, of these failures had already been anticipated, discussed by economists in the past, and um, most of these were not listened to and the Eurozone was started anyway. And many economists had warned that if we do this, this could lead to strife and conflict within the Eurozone, within this monetary union, right? And so the question that arises today is, what is the future of the Eurozone? Are these economists right that have warned that um, the Eurozone in the end will collapse? So I will ask the question, how can we avoid such a disintegration, which is the question of the future of the Eurozone. And in order to do so, let me start out by um, analyzing two of these design failures of the Eurozone, things that were not designed well in the system. One has to do with the, what the economists call the, the optimal currency areas, it's a, it's a jargon that I just put forward here, but the idea is rel relatively simple. Um, when countries are in a monetary union, they will not escape the fact that regularly there will be asymmetric shocks. By that way, we mean that countries are pushed in different directions. Right? Uh, some countries experience a boom, others a recession, etc. And that leads then after a while to the need to adjust. Because some of these countries may, for example, accumulate current account deficits, external debt, and other surpluses. And at some point, this has to be adjusted to. When a country is not in a monetary union, it has a kind of escape valve. It can use its money, for example, by devaluing the currency, to make this adjustment easier, less painful. Once in a monetary union, you don't have that. And you have to do it the hard way, which typically will mean, and we have seen it recently during the crisis of the Eurozone, that countries have to reduce spending, go to austerity, and that leads to a lot of pain for many people, which also has implications for political systems, something economists typically do not take into account in their models. Right? It's not in the model what the political reaction will be when so many people are put into unemployment um, and, and experience severe um, economic um, pain. And as a result, um, we, we, we have a problem here. There's a lack of instruments to deal with this problem. So that's one of the design failures, if you may call them like that, that um, has been stressed and, and I think is very basic. The other one is a little different and arises from the fact that when countries join a monetary union, the governments of these countries have to issue debt in a currency of which they have no control anymore. It's as if they are issuing debt in a foreign currency, like the Dutch government in the past could issue debt in Gilder, now it has to issue debt in euros. And the euros are not controlled by the Dutch government or by any of these members of the monetary union. Right? Which means the following, it means that the governments of the monetary union, like the Dutch government, the French government, etc., cannot give a guarantee to bondholders that they will be paid out at maturity. This contrasts with what I will call a standalone country, take the UK, Sweden, etc., 
countries that have maintained their own currency, when these countries, these governments, issue debt, they can give that guarantee. They can guarantee to the bondholders, don't worry, you will be paid out in the local currency, in pound sterling in the UK or in kroner in Sweden. And why is that? Why can this government give that guarantee? Because there is a central bank backing that government that will, in times of crisis, provide all the liquidity that is necessary to pay out bondholders. And with no limit to the amount of money a central bank can create. And therefore, this is a ironclad guarantee. But that's not what can be done in a monetary union. This has a number of implications that have been analyzed in, in great detail, that have been analyzing in great detail. One is that the very fact that there is no guarantee can lead to self-fulfilling crisis. And we have seen it again. When do, when do these crises erupt? These crises erupt when countries are pulled down in a recession. That's the moment when budget deficits will increase automatically, debts will accumulate, some countries are hit more than others, and as a result, market participants in financial markets may lose their confidence, their trust in that government, and they will sell the bonds, pushing up the interest rates and leading to a massive movement of liquidity out of the countries you don't trust towards the countries you have trust in massive capital movements within the monetary union that tend to destabilize the system. And that lead to a further effect, that is that countries that are hit by this kind of movement are forced to switch off the automatic stabilizers in the budget. Let me explain this, because this may uh, be like jargon of economists. It really means that when countries are hit by a recession and the budget deficit increases automatically because um, governments have less revenue when the economy goes down. These governments are then forced to raise taxes, cut spending, when, when there is a recession. In other words, when you need to stabilize the economy. So the, one of the essential tasks of governments is stripped away. They cannot stabilize their economy anymore. They have to apply pro-cyclical policies that will create a situation where countries are pushed into a bad equilibrium. Right? And that, of course, is something that surprisingly had not been analyzed very well before we started the Eurozone, but has become one of the key questions to solve. So how can we deal with these problems? I've analyzed two of these, uh, what I've called design failures, there are probably others, but let me focus on these two. And, and let me then go back to these two and, and ask the question, how to deal with this problem? What can be done about it? So I take, again, the first issue, the first problem that I analyzed, the fact that countries lack um, tools to deal with asymmetric shocks, situations where they, they diverge from the other countries and they cannot easily adjust from that. The standard response um, has been, based also on a theory, a theoretical development of what is called the optimal currency area theory, the standard response has been, well, um, if you are hit by this bad shock, you just have to be flexible, introduce structural reforms, make your markets product markets more flexible, make your labor markets more flexible so that they can adjust to the shock and you can restore some kind of equilibrium. This has been a very influential idea. You must have heard this um, talk about structural reform and countries being pushed to introduce reforms in the labor markets. We economists like um, flexibility. It's, it's, it's a nice word, but when you look at the fine print of flexibility, and when you apply the medicine of flexibility to real people, then it's not good news, because it implies, for example, cutting wages of people. That's flexible, right? Cut their wages by 20%. When they are unemployed, you tell them, we will reduce your unemployment benefits so that you run faster to, to the job market. We will reduce minimum wages. All these things may be necessary. I'm, as an economist, I'm saying, well, this is necessary. Nothing we can do about this, unfortunately. That's the way it is. 
But you can see that you create a potential political problem because here we are, economists saying, the rules of the monetary union is flexibility. You guys there, you are unemployed, we are going to reduce your unemployment benefits. So what is going to happen politically? Well, it's going to lead to situations where some politicians will stand up and say, well, I have a better way to deal with this problem. Why not get out of the Eurozone? Right? And you create your enemies. And that's, a, I guess, one of the problems we face today, right? That we have applied this kind of medicine, and as a result, we have created our own enemies. And as time goes on, the power of these enemies increases. So that's a political problem. There's also another more economic problem that I want to mention to you, which is the following. The standard idea about um, this problem is that there are asymmetric shocks, right? Some country has a boom, the other a recession, and then you have to adjust to that situation. But what we find is that essentially all the countries of the Eurozone have been going through the same cycle, boom and bust at about the same time. When we started the Eurozone in, in 1999, 2000, um, there was a period of boom until 2007, and then a recession. And every, all these countries have experienced the same boom and bust cycle, which is something very typical in, in capitalism, right? Capitalism is a wonderful system. Um, yeah, I'm here I'm preaching, so it's a wonderful system. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a very unstable system, right? It moves up and down, and when it's going up, it's fantastic. When it's going down, it creates lots of misery to many people. And that's what has been going on. And what we have seen is that some countries have been experiencing a, a more intense boom and bust than others, like the southern European countries. Uh, Ireland is not really southern, but the countries of the periphery have experienced this very strong boom and then um, a, a bust. And others had a much weaker boom-bust cycle, like the Netherlands and Germany in particular. So the asymmetry has basically been in the amplitude of the cycle. We all experienced the same cycle, but in some countries the amplitude was just much more intense, both up and down, creating the problems that I mentioned earlier. That is that when it's going down, those countries that are hit hardest are pushed by the market into a liquidity crisis that can then degenerate into much worse problems. And um, this um, asymmetry then also leads to a problem um, which is that we will have to deal with it in a particular way. So let me conclude this part um, of, of my analysis by saying, yes, there is a need for flexibility. I'm not going to deny that we don't have to have that, but there is probably an even greater need for designing mechanism that will stabilize the business cycle in the Eurozone. Because that, that has become a key problem. And I'm, con I'm struck by the contrast between the US and the Eurozone during the financial crisis. So when the recession hit the US, the following happened. US states that are um, subject by constitutional rules, they have to balance the budget, during the recession, had to raise taxes, reduce spending, so as to maintain a balanced budget, and therefore work pro-cyclically, made the recession worse at the local level. But this was compensated by the existence of a federal government that took a bird's eye view, and with its budget, then decided to work anti-cyclical, to increase spending, reduce taxes, do more investments, so as to stimulate the economy. And, and this more than offset what the states, the US states were doing. And now what I am observing in the Eurozone is that we have all organized ourselves like the US states. All governments now have imposed on themselves balanced budget rules, and they will have to maintain balanced budgets without having created at the level of the Eurozone, a European or a Eurozone authority that can take a bird's eye view and that can stabilize the business cycle when the need arises. 
So what we will have to do if we want to solve this problem is to create such a political authority at the European level that has the capacity to tax and to spend, that has a budget, and that can do these things that happen in other monetary unions like the United States. Let me now turn to the second question, the, the second problem, the fragility of the Eurozone. As, as I mentioned to you, we have this problem that individual governments in the Eurozone have to issue debt in a currency that is not their own and therefore can be gripped by financial markets um, in times of crisis, which then can lead to destabilizing capital flows within the Eurozone. So here, the role of the European Central Bank is key, and the ECB has, in fact, recognized the necessity for the central bank to act. That is, in times of crisis, the ECB should be ready to provide unlimited amount of liquidity in the government bond markets. The ECB, in fact, since 2012, has decided that, yes, this is the right approach. This is called the OMT program, for those of you who have followed um, this discussion, whereby the central bank, the ECB, has committed itself to provide it unlimited amount of liquidity if pressure arises in government bond markets. Very much like the Bank of England will do when the UK government is in trouble. There can be no doubt that if the UK government is in trouble, the Bank of England will step in and provide liquidity to avoid that the sovereign is brought down by financial markets. That's one of the paradoxes of the monetary union, that is that the sovereigns, the national governments, have been weakened. Today, financial markets in the Eurozone can bring individual governments down, and we have seen it. Right? When you stand alone with your own central bank, no financial market can bring you down, because there is a superior force. So the, the ECB has recognized that, yes, it is the role of the central bank to do that, but now an issue arises, which is the following. This OMT program may lack credibility. And we have seen it with the Greek case today, um, a few months ago. Why is that? Well, when a central bank has to decide, shall or I, shall I not intervene in the bond markets to support the government bonds of a particular country, it has to make a decision about the question, is it a pure liquidity problem? That is, it's panic because investors get rid of, of the bonds for, for reasons of, of fear and panic. Or is it a solvency problem? That is, that the government has such a high debt that it cannot possibly continue to service the debt. That's a key question a central bank has to answer. And if it decides it's a liquidity problem, then the rule is the central bank should intervene. If it's a solvency problem, then it's not the central bank that has to intervene. Then the question arises whether other governments of the monetary union will be willing to support that government. And that's a decision a central bank can essentially not take. It's, it puts too much political weight on the central bank, mainly because it's extremely difficult to find out whether these problems are liquidity problems or solvency problems. Usually, it's a mix of the two. It's extremely difficult. So that, therefore, when the ECB has to intervene and decide to intervene, it risks creating political upheaval conflicts that it cannot really solve. And this can, I think, only be solved um, by going forward um, into political union. Again, the problem does not exist for standalone countries. Take the United Kingdom. The commitment of the central bank, of the Bank of England, to support the sovereign, that is the, English, the British government in times of crisis, is unconditional. Therefore, it's 100% credible. And therefore, you will not have these financial attacks, attacks by financial markets against the, the British government. This comes at a price, of course, and the price is that the commitment of the Bank of England to price stability may not be 100%. A 
because it is promising to provide unlimited amount of liquidity in times of crisis. It has also made a promise of price stability, but that will have to go if that commitment has to be realized. And so there is a price to be paid. Paradoxically, the ECB is in a reverse situation, and that is that its commitment to provide liquidity support to government is weak, and therefore, its commitment to maintain price stability may actually be higher than in the case of the United Kingdom. But I come back to my main theme, the only way to solve this problem, the lack of credibility of the ECB as a lender of last resort in the government bond market, is by creating a budgetary union that includes a consolidation of a significant part of national debts and when you do that, when you consolidate national debts, you create a new relation between a central bank and a government that has issued that consolidated debt. But that, of course, also requires creation of a government at a European level, which is a huge political jump uh, to take. But that's the only way to avoid that in times of crisis, the Eurozone will be subject again to these destabilizing flows within the Eurozone. So, let me conclude. I have identified the conditions under which the Eurozone's fragility can be eliminated, making it possible for the Union to survive. So, here I am, I have the solution. Right? That's what you have to do, political union. But these conditions are so intrusive politically requiring such a large transfer of sovereignty from nation states to a central Eurozone authority that the conclusion of anybody who is not living in an ivory tower, even not somebody standing on this pulpit, this is impossible. There is no way one can envision such a future, at least not a near future. Of course, I've learned in the past that quite often ideas that we thought were politically impossible to realize become possible if conditions are extreme enough. So one may hope that conditions become extreme enough so that <laughs> these jumps, this political integration jumps can be made. But today, I would maintain the conclusion, no, this is out of reach. So there are two possible ways one can react to this. One can say, well, it's impossible. Let's blow up the whole thing. Let's dissolve the monetary union. It will blow up in the future anyway. Why not do it now in an orderly fashion? That's one possibility. Right? Many economists, um, observers, think in those terms. Right? You cannot really save the system in the future. So let's now orderly deconstruct it, like an engineer who deconstructs a building right, in an orderly fashion. I don't think economists know the signs of orderly deconstruction. <laughs> and therefore, I'm a little bit afraid for that solution. And I would rather take the view that maybe it's better to say, well, yes, it's going to be difficult, but maybe we should try. Um, the chances of success are slim, but let's try anyway. And that's the position I'm taking. And when you take that position, you quickly come to the view that the only strategy that can work is a strategy of small steps. Some people will call it muddling through. Right? That's the more negative way of, of phrasing this. But basically, it's a policy of small steps, a revolutionary approach will just not do it. When I was a student, of course, I was a revolutionary, um, but I've learned um, with the age that these things are probably worse than anything else. And therefore, small steps is the way to do. What are these small steps? Let me just consider two that have some chance of ever being established. One is to create some fiscal space at the level of the Eurozone, for example, by an unemployment insurance mechanism, a common unemployment insurance mechanism, you would bring money together so as to 
uh, finance um, and employment insurance and only the business cycle component, you don't want to, to finance the, the structurally and employ it in, in Greece or something for, for eternity, but just a cyclical component of, of um, unemployment could be financed jointly, right? And you would also have to take care of the fact that there is a common cycle so that sometimes this um, fund, this uh, unemployment insurance scheme may have to run into deficits when you are in a recession, provided it runs surpluses during boom. So we could, in fact, create such a common scheme. And there have been proposals made in the direction, for example, the four presidents' reports that came out two or three years ago has such a, a proposal. Another step is, another small step is to um, create a, a program of limited debt consolidation. Right? Of course, if you, as you know, when you do that, debt consolidation, you create moral hazard risk. That is, since you bring, bring your debt together, some people of some countries will exploit the situation and say, well, since the others are also guaranteeing the debt, why don't I create more debt? Right? Making life easier for me and having the others pay for it. So that's a very big problem that arises as soon as you move forward towards political union. But let me remind you that this will remain the key element in any movement towards political union. Any political union has insurance schemes embedded. Right? If you are in a political union, you know that if you are hurt badly, there will be mechanism that will compensate you at least partly, and, and that is what uh, we will have to do in a monetary union. We will have to move forward. We will have to have an open eye for moral hazard issues, and that's why I think this can only work if there is also an element of co-insurance, where you make clear that you will bring together, consolidate part of the debt, leaving some of the debt at the individual country level to be financed by individual countries so that they keep the responsibility for that accumulation. So these are just a few proposals. There are plenty of proposals that take this view that we, we can move with small steps forward. They are small, but even these small steps, as you know, encounter severe hostility. For example, the proposal I'm mentioning about consolidating the debt is at this moment politically impossible. Um, in, in a number of countries, there is a total rejection of that idea. Now, it may come back. Right? At some point, what is now politically impossible can become politically possible. Our task as economists is to make the following choice very clear to the rest of the population. And that's the following. We should tell them that if they want to keep the euro, steps towards more political union are inevitable. That should be clear, right? Political unification is inevitable if we want to keep the euro. So that's one choice. You want to keep the euro? Then we have to move into political union. If, on the other hand, you say, we don't want political union, then the logic of that choice is that the euro is unsustainable and will not be maintained. Right? So that is the choice we have to make clear to the population. So I, as an economist, have not a pre-view here. Of course, I have some sympathies, as I told you, but the task of economists is to say, well, these are the choices. You want the euro, then the road to sustainability of the EU is political union. You don't want that road, and there is another road, but that will lead to a disintegration of the EU. Thank you for your attention.